Can you figure out a way to maybe log into my Zoom and turn on this AI summary thing on every call rather than me having to click it? That's a setting for me. They offer it free here, but I just don't want to have to click it every fucking time. Hang on. What's up, everybody? We got people loading up. It's going good, Travis. It's going real good. Having a great day. Working on having a better hair day. You know, <laughs> over over 35. I never knew what a bad hair day was till I hit like 35 to 38. And then oh, it's you're such a baby still. Jeez. <laughs> no. You had another 35 to that. And then worry Come about on, it. You fucking whore. <laughs> Dang. Oh man. yeah, no kidding. You're still a puppy, Nicholas. You're just still a puppy. Yeah. Compared to me, you're still a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm getting there. I'm getting, you know, it, it's crazy. It's crazy how relative everything is too, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's wild. Like I hang out with my mom a lot and I just got done hanging out with my friend's niece. She's 18 years old. We went like one wheeling together and it's just wild to catch the world from like an 18 year old's perspective to hear how smart they are, to hear everything that they're going through. You know, it's like, it's, Life is so crazy, you know? It, it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's 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 get rocking on. Guys, today we're gonna do a live Q&A session. So if anyone needs anything or anyone has any questions, start thinking of those. Me and Francisco are gonna be right here to help. Um, Francisco might be leading the session, but I'm not going anywhere. We're actually in the same house today. Francisco came over today at 10 a.m. He did not know that I now sleep in at 10 till 10 a.m. every day. Uh, so he was my alarm clock this morning. Um, but but it was it was really nice to see you, Francisco. Thanks for hanging out with me today uh, at the house. Uh, but yeah, guys. So if, if you guys have any questions, well, you know, first I definitely want to start by. Uh, bringing it back to someone who donates a lot of their time to solving a lot of our answers, and that is uh, Mason McDonald. You know, uh, Mason is uh, Mason's been a huge help in here. He jumps in every week. Uh, he provides value. He helps people out. He also has an amazing business that I'll let him tell you about briefly, where they actually help our clients. They will fund the deals. They will do a little bit more than that. Mason, if you want to just introduce yourself briefly, I know it's been a couple of weeks and uh, maybe remind everyone of that great service you offer as well. So as you're providing value throughout the day, they know that uh, that you're giving back first, you know, which is great. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Nicholas. Um, Mason McDonald, I own a few different real estate investing companies, um, but the one that Nick is talking about right now is Ground Up partners and ground up fund. Uh, it's all part of one entity in which we uh, will fund people's land deals. Uh, we do equity splits. So if you have a property under contract and are interested in someone providing all of the capital, doing all of the marketing and selling the property and you getting a profit split on the back end, uh, that's what we do. So I can put a few links in the bio. Um, but yeah, this company came to be by me and my business partner, between the two of us, we've done probably four or 500 land deals in the past couple of years. Uh, and the biggest issue is access to capital. So working on solving that problem for everyone, uh, slowly but surely. So here, if you guys need me. Awesome. Yeah, and Ma Mason's company is is awesome. They're successful. They'll do a couple of things. If they can fund the deal, they'll actually help you move the deal too. And so he, he's really like, as long as they take the deal on, it's basically hands off for you for the remainder of the process other than following up with them, which I think that's huge. You know, I know you guys come to me for turnkey solutions. So I am trying to curate the best turnkey solutions for you. 
And uh, so in a couple of weeks here, I'm going to work on having Brent Daniels or his partner on here. They just launched a PPC offer that's so good. It makes me want to be a real estate investor, you know, where they actually build you the website. They build it's They don't just run your PPC. They actually um, build everything for like twenty five hundred dollars a month and run your PPC. And I was like, you do what? Uh, one of their competitors is $5,000 a month and they don't build out all the bells and whistles. So, um, so I'm working on really curating some of the best deals out there from the most trusted names. Um, and Mason's totally a part of that. And he's one of our biggest clients too. And the other cool thing about that is someone that actually knows how to work our leads. And I think that that's really important. I love working with people like Wyatt. We had Wyatt on last week. You know, why it's closed, I think three deals and two thousand dollars invested with us. And that's even for houses. So I like attaching the people like Wyatt and going, Well, hey, you know, you know exactly what to do. So if you have students or if you have support, you know how to guide them as well. Um, but guys, if you have any questions, uh go ahead, go ahead and feel free to raise your hand, drop it in the chat, uh, or do both. And we'll get it, we'll get it rocking and rolling. I'll pop it off because I do got a few questions for Mason. I'm super glad he's on here. Mm -hmm. um, so Mason, I do know that you like fund deals and partner with people nationwide. Um, but do you have like top three areas where we could like do some further investigation or some further research so we can pinpoint some areas where you like you're either actively investing in or funding deals in? So that way we can just start sending you opportunities that are more in line with what you currently have your eyes set out on. Yeah, I mean, the, the most bullish area that I'm personally investing in, in my own business is the greater Colorado Springs market. Um, so eastern El Paso County, uh, southeastern Doug Douglas County, um, and kind of anywhere around there. Uh, I'm looking to take down probably another um, thousand plus acres in the next year out here. Uh, I've got several hundred going on right now. Um, but yeah, markets that we have familiarity with. So Florida, the Carolinas, uh, Texas, Colorado, Arizona, um, starting to do a good amount in the Huntsville area of Alabama. We just funded one in Oklahoma. I don't know where it is. It is somewhere in the state of Oklahoma, uh, but that was a great one. It was buy for 44, sell for 70 in like an hour. Um, so that was a good one. But uh, yeah, th those are kind of the primary markets. Sunbelt, Southeast. Colorado, Arizona, and Texas. Gotcha. Sweet. Cool. Someone asked in the chat, do you deal with unbuildable land? I think that's Ter Terrence. I think I spoke to you last week. Um, I think we're, Terrence, we were talking about some joints in New Jersey. I think he's in the car. Yeah, yeah, New Jersey. New Jersey. Okay, yeah. No, I we, we don't touch land that you can't build on. If it's recreational land, and there's a ton of comps and there's a local realtor that's sold very, very similar property recently, we'll consider it. Um, but if there's no end use to it, uh, yeah, I'd recommend staying away from it um, unless it, you know you can move it. Thanks. Any other questions? Cause I got plenty. I don't want to hog all the questions up. But what about New Jersey? Does he do? You, do you deal with New Jersey, New Jersey at all, or the Northeast? Uh, I've done one in Pennsylvania. Um, I almost partnered on one in New York, but we ended up canceling it. Uh, we'll do a deal anywhere as long as the minimum sale price is over twenty thousand. Uh, there's verifiable comps, and there's a local realtor opinion of value that has actually sold land nearby. Um. That's kind of our like base minimum criteria. Uh, I'll put our website in the chat. There's like a couple minute long video um, uh, right at the beginning that explains what we do uh, with our deal criteria. We try to keep it as simple as possible. Um, there are many times where people um, unfortunately don't fill out the form. Uh, please fill out the form in its entirety. If you don't know the answers, uh, figure them out. Um, type of thing. But uh, yeah, we will do Jersey for sure, Terrence. Thank you. I got, I got a question. A... Oh, yeah. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. I was just curious to Mason, you 
obviously you said you you take them especially if you can flip them quickly like what do you guys use for the resale side like the dispo is it mainly buyer's list or is it other things local realtor yeah because you guys close on every deal pretty much okay. yeah i i've got one right now um i might end up double closing depending on the timeline uh i've I've only done maybe six assignment deals in my life um, just because, I don't know, um, certain, I'm, I'm relatively anti-litigious and if your contract isn't super strong uh, on the acquisition side, um, kind of structuring novation agreements. So I'm working with my legal team on having a really solid novation agreement so I can start doing more of those um, rather than just an assignment. Uh, but yeah, local realtors typically, and we do transactional funding too. Um, if yeah. you know people are able to get the A to B contract lined up in B to C, uh, typically it's smaller dollar amounts, like on a transactional funding under, usually under two hundred and fifty thousand uh, for one of those ones. Yeah. Okay. I'll submit a couple land deals to you and see if you like them. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Just make sure they're under contract and watch the video yeah. and everything. Yeah. What's what are you <laughs> charged sure. on franchise? actual funding uh we're three percent or 2k whichever, whichever one is more. whichever one is more yeah three percent or 2k oh. so okay. there's okay. better rates out there but yeah, beggars uh, can be choosers <laughs> yeah when we're not trying to gouge anyone it's just um it's an unintended consequence of being in this business uh that we've started offering the product so if there's better rates out there obviously, and with anyone. Um, I don't view anyone in the funding space as competition. Uh, I'm working with other funders in the space to fund my deals too. Um, our pipeline is too big uh, to, you know, be able to do it. Of, So um, I've got references and friends that are in the industry doing the exact same thing that I refer business out to all the time. Nice. Um, I do have a question about deal structures. So let's just say I'm licensed in Florida and I bring you a deal to fund in the state of Florida. Obviously, I can't use myself as an opinion of value for, you know, on the retail side to give you like, hey, this is what I think it's worth. But would we be able to structure agreements where like I list the property, obviously, and then we split the proceeds because I'm licensed in Florida? Yeah, so, I mean, if if you'd be able to move it. um gotcha. You know, there, there are certain Florida markets that, uh, you know, my business partner has done, you know, 100 deals in that we've got a really great realtor out there. Um, but yeah, I mean, as long as you have experience moving land in that market, um, then yeah, there's there's definitely opportunity. For us, it's obviously legal first and then numbers second. Um, sure. So if, if everything works out legally, um and the numbers make sense. Yeah, we'll we'll do just about anything. Sweet. Anybody else have any questions? Doug, where are you about to go, Doug? Excuse me. Yeah, I'm trying to grab some lunch in in between here. Um, I'm I'm uh. LLC in South Carolina, um, looking at doing some deals in North Carolina. And I know there's something about foreign entities that you have to register. How does all that work as far as uh, what I have to have and where, uh, you know, just, just to kind of get an idea of what the next step would be uh, to legally, like Mason said, do business in another state as a foreign entity. So each state's going to have it. Oh, let me, I'm not an attorney. Don't take my advice. <laughs> right. Hire an attorney. Uh, don't listen to me. If you listen to me and you get in trouble, it's not my fault. Uh, um, but many states have different requirements of operating as a foreign entity. Uh, since a lot of the time you're not actually technically doing business in the state, uh, you don't necessarily have to register with the secretary of state um, to conduct business. North Carolina is one of those ones where you are typically going to have a foreign LLC. So if you go onto the North Carolina Secretary of State web website and register yourself as a foreign LLC, um, that's it. It's, I don't think, very expensive, like a couple hundred bucks max. 
uh, and they'll send you like confirmation instantly. Uh, I think I've done it with like three or four different companies in North Carolina and it's a super easy process. And then whenever you're closing a deal, um, typically in any county that you're operating in, in the country, uh, you're going to do a statement of authority um, with that county whenever uh, you open up title. Um, so North Carolina is an attorney state. Uh, so whoever your closing attorney is, they're going to ask you for all the documents. And if you don't have anything, um, a good closing attorney is just going to recommend you, hey, go here, sign up for this thing or do that thing type of thing. Is there an advantage to just going ahead and getting an LLC in North Carolina uh, over doing the other way that you're talking about? Or uh, I, I would talk to your CPA about that. Um, oh, okay, right. Of uh, just what what it makes sense from like a tax status, and then you know if you have like an S corp that is going to be the owner of that LLC. Um, I don't think it makes too much difference other than your uh, annual filings are going to start getting more expensive um, depending on if you're paying. I don't, I don't even know if North Carolina is a state income tax state or not, but uh, yeah, though you, you can get it as complex or as simple as you want with entity structuring. Um, and asset protection, uh, it's super easy to register as a foreign entity in North Carolina. Um, so that's what I would do. Uh, have you done a deal in North Carolina yet, Doug? No. no. Yeah. So what you, you can send mail, you can call people, you can do whatever it takes. And then once you get a deal under contract and you submit it to title, uh, title company will just guide you in the right direction. So uh, that way you don't have to necessarily worry about putting the cart before the horse, but once again, not an attorney, talk to an attorney and get advice from them. Thanks Mason. I appreciate it. Sure. I have a question. Can I go? Yeah, go for it. Cool. Um, I just had like five deals fall through with uh, fraudulent sellers uh, being out of the country. Uh, are you are you noticing any of that, like foreign land sellers, fraudulent selling? You know, I've never had it happen in my business, um, but we have had deals submitted to us uh, with um, fraudulent sellers. Uh, so I think anecdotally, I've heard evidence that other people are experiencing it more often, especially whenever they're doing a lot of cold texting, calling and emailing. Uh, yeah which there is um, relatively simple ways to kind of resolve it um, of whenever you're having a conversation with the person um, and they refuse to talk on the phone or email or, or, you know, if they'll only email or text, um, have them, you know, send a copy of their ID uh, to you um, or say, okay, well, the address associated with the property owner is here. Uh, let's for this purchase agreement, um, you know, let's have a mobile notary come out to meet you in person to sign this. And you can, you don't need a notary um, for a purchase agreement, but uh, it can potentially add comfort to people that are afraid of scams on the sales side. And then if you're worried about it um, on the buy side, obviously, uh, you'd be able to bet them out. Yeah, these were deals uh, on market. So came by agents and they were supposed to vet them. And they don't do a good job at vetting and they leave it up to me and my title company to figure it out. Yep. I wouldn't use that agent anymore then. Yeah. So it's becoming really annoying. I'm trying to figure out some disclosures I could put in our contracts to kind of like eliminate them after seven days. Yeah. Like, um, like a Zoom call with ID within the first seven days or a credit check with a third party company with ID within the first seven days. Without mm -hmm. sending after seven days, then we could send our first deposit after verification. Yeah, that, I mean that makes sense, and you know, I I use a title company for every transaction, and I know Fidelity started using a it's called like MeTech, M I T E K, uh, for ID verification. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I I always encourage the you know, do extra uh, to mm -hmm. not get yourself in a fraudulent scenario. Nice. And sometimes, and other, I'm sorry. No, Dennis, I was just going to add some title companies or even notaries, they have the capabilities of doing uh, RON signings, like uh, 
electronic notaries. Uh -huh. um, they'll enter into a room, they'll upload their ID first, and then the, the right. notary will walk them through virtual. It's hard to do that when the seller's out of the country, though. In the country, uh -huh. you could do that. No, nah, like, like the virtual one should be easy because I did it with uh, someone from the Philippines uh, like a couple months ago. Okay. Um, and then as long as they either have like a U.S. based like uh, government issued ID, they'll like okay. upload their they'll scan their ID into the portal. The notary uh -huh. will receive it. And then if they're, you know, overseas or in the States, they'll hmm. verify the documentation. OK, yeah. All right, I thought it was only good for uh, in in the country. Yeah. All right. Uh, my other question for you, Mason, was um, you know, I'm using the MLS to find out my buyers. Um, it gives us good information on who's the buyer and who represents them. When I go out of my market, um, what, what, what do you suggest when you go out of your market? What platform do you suggest to figure out who the buyers? um for for the properties yeah so i typically almost always relist uh with a local agent um mm -hmm. however uh neighbors are always a great option like doing a mm -hmm. deal in alabama right now bought it for 140 selling for 250 um you know not even gonna have to put it on the market because we're gonna sell it to the next door neighbor i just had wow. my agent when he was out there taking pictures just i was like they bought their house for 1.1 million like nine months ago. Uh, just go knock on the door and see uh, if they would be interested. Um, mm -hmm. And he didn't. They are. Uh, okay. So neighbors are always a great option. Um, but if, you know, I use PropStream for my data polling. Um, mm -hmm. They have quick list filters for cash buyers and then filter for vacant land. You can look at the companies um, that are uh, buying regularly. And then depending on the lot and what the land use is, if it's like simple infill lots, um, look up home builder and whatever area you're doing business in uh, and just call and see if they're purchasing land in the area uh, and what their buy box is. And, you know, that sort of thing uh, is kind of how I would go about it. Okay. So this property you got was a residential infill lot in Huntsville. Uh, it's not, I don't remember what city it's in, but somewhere around there. Yeah. Okay. Um, so how do you know when you, when you jump around like state to take state to state and, um, how do you figure out what your due diligence is? Cause in Florida we have to do like turtles and land, uh, soil, you know, figure out how much each turtle nest has to get relocated for. It's like eight grand or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, in, in any market, um, there's standard due diligence and then there's the market specific due diligence. So, yeah. uh, standard due diligence obviously starts with, um, just calling the County, uh, either the assessor's office, uh, office and, or the planning and zoning and, or the building department, uh, to have okay. a conversation to make sure that the land conforms with the use that it's intended to. Uh, sometimes it's super obvious whenever it's just, you know, a square infill lot, like right in the middle of a subdivision. Sometimes it's less obvious whenever there's uh, complexities to it. Uh, yeah. Always look at uh, flood zone wetlands and then state state specific wetlands. Like for instance, uh -huh. in New York, um, you know, I killed a deal uh, yesterday or not yesterday, a couple of days ago that we were going to do because uh, it was going to be a subdivision project redevelopment on 35 uh -huh. acres, uh, all of the standard stuff checked out but there's new york specific wetlands um that doesn't show up on like you know fish and wildlife services and that sort of thing uh but you know related to what you're saying of box turtles in florida or burrowing owls or you know uh, ferrets in colorado and field mice right. and these weird you know weird um specific things it's speaking to a local land specialist realtor uh oh. the person that saved me in new york on that deal um, I think on his website, he had sold like 200,000 plus acres in his career and over half a billion in land. Um, wow. and he was like, this deal is worth this much. Um, you cannot do this, 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 and this with it, unless you're purchasing, you know, upwards of 2 million in wetland mitigation, mitigation credits and blah, blah, blah. Um, so mm -hmm. land specific local realtor, um, is who you want to work with and find out, uh, cause they know, they know all that stuff. Thank you. 
Absolutely. Any other question, guys? Someone asked, uh, do you suggest criteria or filter when pulling a list for land? Yeah, um, I think uh, it all depends on what your plan is. Uh, if you're targeting just infill lots, um, you can filter uh, more specifically for residential. Uh, however, CropStream sometimes excludes certain lots depending on the use and everything like that. So a lot of times when I'm pulling lists, I'm very targeted with the lists that I'm pulling. Uh, I never pull by the county or a zip code or a state or something like that because, you know, one street over um, the land could be worthless. So I do very targeted polygon pulls on PropStream, pulling only very specific subdivisions. Uh, and then you don't even have to filter for anything other than just land um, whenever you're pulling at that level. Uh, it's kind of how I go about it. But, um, you know, when I target other stuff, like when I'm looking at several hundred or thousand acre properties, I'll include land, agriculture. Uh, sometimes I include houses too, whenever it's like going up to a certain size, but just because there's a play of, you know, splitting off the house and, you know, doing a, a subdivision with, you know, all the extra land. But um, that's kind of on the land filtering side. On the ownership side, uh, the like standard is out of state, out of county, seven plus years, uh, individuals and trusts only, um, seven plus years of ownership, I mean. and. Uh, I'll look at LLC sometimes, but typically I just do individuals and trusts on the ownership side. Seven years. So, I don't know if that answers your question, Terrence. Yeah, yes, it did. Very, very informative. Thank you. Um, I did have kind of like a conversational point in, in regards to kind of like picking markets and deciding which areas to kind of like target or prospect in, right? Is there certain numbers of, is there a certain amount of number of sold vacant land that you look for to give you a good indication like, hey, this is a good area that I want. And then what's that, what does that look like as far as, you know, scouting a new market? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've gone back and forth on this. I've operated in several dozen markets in the country and I'm I'm not scaling my back my business, but I'm consolidating the markets uh, that have been uh, the most effective in terms of IRR for a deal um, because there are certain markets where I've got 400 days um, sitting on the market right now. Uh, and I've got other markets where my average days on market are 30 days or less. Um, so I think market familiarity of just like having done a deal in it is fantastic. And speaking with the local agents, uh, in terms of metrics, like at a high level, uh, if you look at, if you go on Zillow filter for land, put it on sold in the last 90 days, listed in the last 90 days, uh, if it's one or greater, um, in terms of ratio of a hundred properties sold and 95 properties came on the market. Uh, that's a pretty hot market um, right there. So usually you want that to be within like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 standard deviation of one uh, whenever you're looking at 90 days to six months um, sold to for sale ratio. And then whenever you're pulling lists, make sure to like go look at what's for sale and not just look at the ratio. Um, you know, see if there's any particular areas within that market that you're looking at where, oh crap, if I get a property in this area, it's going to sit on the market for, you know, everything's got 600 days on market. And then kind of just like click on the comps. Like don't just look at the numbers, like click on the actual comps. And uh, people get lost in that sometimes, especially since so many people in this business do uh, rural deals. Uh, a property with well and septic installed and a driveway is significantly more valuable than one that has no improvements on it whatsoever. Um, you know, and it's not just related to the cost of the well or the septic or the driveway. Usually there's a multiplier there that's going to be included. So just make sure you're clicking on comps, getting familiarity. Uh, whenever you are in a market, you should start learning it street by street of, you know, there's certain markets in the country that you could tell me 
the address of it and I can tell you what it's worth because uh, I've done enough business there. So spending time in it um, and then realizing that uh, you need a lot of data before you can make an assumption on it. Uh, if you told, told me it's like, oh, this market's not producing, I sent 300 letters there. Uh, and there's 50,000 parcels on that market, you know, in the area, uh, try sending two or 300,000 letters and then, you know, come back and see if the data uh, will show it's producing. So if it's a good producing market and you're willing to dive into it, spend as much time as you possibly can in it before you, you know, start pivoting to another one just because you got uh, shiny object syndrome. Yeah. Because I think oftentimes, and I know Nick gets this question all the time as far as like, well, what market should I be in, right? And I think oftentimes the go-to approach is to see how many lots sold and the traction and stuff like that. But to your point, days on market also is a good indicator to kind of keep your eye out on because no one wants to sit on deals for a longer, a longer than they have to, right? Um, and then in those, do you think like uh, economical conditions affect days on market in certain areas or like what can you talk to a little bit? I know we're in election year. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. If you go back and look at the last eight elections, um, there's not too much uh, related to it that would create an indication of um, new construction or uh, you know, land sales or anything. So I think having data to validate any assumptions that you have is crucial. Um, backing up for just a second, like the reason I'm hammering the point home of land specific agent, uh, there's deals I've done markets and, you know, where there hasn't been a land sale in like six months, like this random town in Oklahoma, there were no comps, but the realtor was extremely competent. We got three offers within, you know, like I said, a few hours of going on market in this random place in Oklahoma. Um, same thing has happened in Pennsylvania and Pottstown, Pennsylvania, uh, and the whatever uh, Alabama one that we did, uh, Portland, Alabama, I think, that I would never do if people hadn't brought deals to us. Um, so people will bring deals to us, and I'm like, shoot, I'm going to start marketing in that area too uh, to see if um, you know we can make extra stuff happen. But I think like looking at more, in you know, microeconomic trends. Uh, like, and, and I make mistakes in business all the time. Like I, I, I've lost money in this business. I've made money in this business. I've made tons of mistakes that um, even new, you know, and I am new to this. I've only been doing it almost three years now. Uh, we had a deal in Denison, Texas that we funded, bought it for 20 grand, give or take. Uh, all the comps suggested a $45,000 sale price. Everything looked good. Uh, the city in like December, uh, changed the laws of going from $0 in impact fees to 13,000 in impact fees. Every single builder exited the market except two. Uh, so we might take a huge loss on the, well, not huge, but you know, 10 or $15,000 loss on that deal or come up with some sort of, you know, interesting idea of doing a seller finance or joint venture with a builder that is willing to build or partner on it. Cause there's still money to be made, obviously, uh, if structured in the right way, but, uh, looking at what, is on like the development plans within city council meeting minutes and uh, county county meetings and that sort of thing uh, at the local government level um, is crucial. And then uh, NAR has a ton of good data, like U-Haul, all look at where people are moving. Um, the census data is crucial. And it's going to show the same thing that uh, data has shown for the past decades. People are moving to the South. You know, people leave California, people move back to California. Everyone talks about this huge California exodus and huge New York exodus and all this stuff that's happening. But they're also, you know, people moving in. People will always want to live in California. People will always want to live in New York. People will always want to live in Washington. Um, so look at the data. There's so much data out there. And if you don't know what data to look at, uh, ask ChatGPT of what data should I be looking at? And, you know, you mentioned a sleeper that I've never thought of is U-Haul. U-Haul will probably have all of the data that of people that are selling, moving, relocating. That is that is actually a sleeper one that I did not expect, which but it makes sense a lot. Oh, yeah. Anyone else has any questions? You can either raise your hand or you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Hi, it's Elias here. What what was the U-Haul uh, comment that you were talking about? I missed it. I'm sorry. 
just like using U-Haul or like moving companies like Atlas Van, like there, there's a handful of like moving companies out there. Um, let me see if I can just like find a link uh, to see where people are moving and what state net in migration and out migration is going on. Census.gov has this data too. Um, so let's see if I can, you know, moving trends, pods has a blog on it, market watch. So if you Google something along the lines of where, where are people moving to, um, read, you know, it, I think it's important to keep up with the industry and, uh, there, there's so many Google searches that you can do that is exactly rated, you know, related to it of are single family housing permits up right now, or are they down or, uh, how much new inventory is going on the market. So whenever you're going into these markets, like don't just look on Zillow or Redfin or whatever and see what the the land sales are. Go and look and see new construction 2024. How many houses are getting built? Where are those houses getting built? See if there's a large acreage tract next to one of those new development communities then that's owned by an individual owner and like have a sniper focus. So you can, you know, zoom in and zoom out in this business as what as much as you want. Um, because it's really easy to get distracted and if you don't have the ability to spend, you know, five, 10, 30,000 a month on marketing, uh, go on the county assessor's website and look at the data that I'm bringing up right now of where, where is land selling, where is new construction occurring, and go into the county assessor's website, find those people. You can skip trace them for free a lot of the time where I think Nick does, uh, what, like three cent skip tracing or something like that. I think I got an email about that. Um, uh, that's seven cents. I think he was promoting like three cents skip tracing normally doesn't give you like good data and stuff like that. Oh, well, if he wasn't still asleep, uh, he could tell us, um, <laughs> just yeah. kidding, buddy. Um, but yeah, I mean, there, there's tons of cheap skip tracing resources out there, like free people search where you can go very sniper focused and target these people yourself. Um, write a handwritten letter. Uh, put it in a Hallmark card. Um, you know, if you're taking action every day, uh, that's the most important thing. And depending on where you're at in the business, that might make sense. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. Of Even for me, sometimes when I get bogged down in like the high level stuff, I'll just write a handwritten letter myself just to like feel like I'm making progress. Because sometimes whenever you get to a level where you're doing so much and so many big transactions, like it's nice to just like have little wins uh, in the business. Yeah. Agree. Thank you. Thank you, Mason. What so, what is the largest contributor? I'm sorry. I jumped in front of somebody. Go ahead. No, okay, you can go. Okay, thanks. Um, what's the biggest contributor to days on market in excess of what 200 days or whatever? Is it just buy the wrong property? Yeah. Yeah, okay. buyer pool sometimes, uh, level of improvement sometimes. Um, you know, it like I I've got this deal in Franktown, Colorado that we've hit like 450 days on market. Uh, it's a luxury Ouch. luxury community. Um, bought it for 350 thousand. Uh, my realtor at the time, who has since been fired, um, said it was a grand slam deal at 750 k. Uh, we could move it instantly at 600. Uh, and here we are 400 plus days later at 469,000 on the market. Um, and it's priced appropriately. There's comps that have sold, uh, new homes in the area are selling for upwards of 3 million. Uh, so builders are super interested in it, but just like many of you guys, um, have experienced and I've experienced in this business, uh, getting a loan on land is really, really hard to get. And so some builders don't have the capital to drop nearly half a million plus, or, you know, even a little less than that now on building a single family home, even if they're willing to or able to sell it for two or $3 million, um, just because of carrying costs and that sort of thing. So buyer pool, I think is the most important one. And then from that, you can extrapolate of, uh, is it because it's too expensive? Is it because no one wants to live there? Uh, because it's in the middle of the desert, you can't access it, all sorts of stuff like that. But yeah, if there's nationwide builders building in the area, that's a good indicator that uh, days on market will ideally be a lot lower. 
So what was it that bit you? Horton, that sort of thing. What what was it that bit you? What do you mean? I mean, as far as what have you figured out why it's taken so long to sell? Is it just you know not yeah, the right about, place, too high, too many? There's about three sales a year in the area. So um, you know, we uh there's just not enough buyers in that particular market. So it's one of those things where depending on what your business model is, uh, I could have held the price probably in the mid 500, 600 range uh, if I was willing to keep it on the market for two or three years. And that's a great investment, you know, in the grand scheme of things, buy it for 350, sell it for 500, two years later. Like if you talk to a house flipper, I mean, that's, that's an insane deal right there. Um, unfortunately, like one of the challenges with this business is uh, depends on your individual business philosophy of are you attempting to build a balance sheet or are you attempting to build a, uh, you know, P&L focused business? And I am more focused uh, on building a P&L business of consistent cash flow on a monthly basis rather than, hey, look, I've got five million in inventory. Um, you know, I'd rather make a 20 or 30% cash on cash return in 20 or 30 days or 60 days, then I would make a 200% cash on cash return in 600 days. So it's individual business philosophy and viewing it as a business rather than, you know, like a long-term investment. Like I buy NVIDIA stock and Apple stock and stuff like that. And my intention is to hold it forever uh, rather than, you know, a piece of dirt in Arizona or Colorado or Florida. My goal is to move it as quick as possible if I'm not doing improvements to it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. I think you had a next question. Go ahead. Still on or? Okay, I think he left. Okay, so I have a question. If you're still good, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Okay, hey Mason, you said uh, something about subdividing lots too. Are you doing um, those more often now? And if you do that, um, are you just surveying and recording those, or are you having to do like more involved subdivision? Uh, I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm not at a level yet where I'm comfortable doing the huge ones. Uh, yeah. so I look more at like ag lot splits or, um, you know, minor subdivisions where survey replat, submit it to the County, get it recorded. Uh, okay. so like project I have going on right now is, uh, 200 acres, splitting it into five forties and super easy process for that. Okay. And you just buy them outright or do you sell or carry those? On the acquisition? Yeah. Uh, we'll buy it outright. Okay. Just checking. I'd love to sell or carry. Right. <laughs> so when you offer. can find so, them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I always try to give a couple offers uh, whenever I offer on anything from the, you know, quick cash, 30 days or less, cash close, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's the more motivated sellers. Uh, and then, you know, standard offer. 60 days, you know, 45 day due diligence, uh, kind of the middle of the road. And then the longer term seller finance, novation agreement, uh, 180 day close, that sort of thing on the more, more complex properties. Uh, the most important thing always is just lock it up under contract and then figure out what to do with it. If you have a general idea of what the property is worth, because uh, if you could get it under contract, then at least you have a real feasible ability to potentially renegotiate. Um mm -hmm. Or, you know, find a find a good exit. Are you in the kind of 50, 60 percent range as far as offers or are you less than that? It depends. Yeah. If you know, I've if I can buy it at a hundred and move it at 130 in an hour, uh right. <laughs> I mean it's a great deal right there. Uh so it it I kind of like calculate it just based on what my anticipated annualized return would be of yeah. um, the higher, the better. So I, I seek out, you know, quadruple digit annualized return in any deal, um, ideally. Uh, yeah. But if it's, but I mean, the way to think about that is if you bought it for 
10,000 sold it for 13,000 in 30 days, 30% cash on cash return, you know, give or take. Um, but your annualized return is going to be, you know, multiple thousand percent. Right. Cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, Mason, I do have another question for you from uh, from an experience side, right? What has been the biggest takeaway that you've learned in the last quarter that you're going to implement differently in towards the end of Q4 or going into Q4? Yeah, I think um, I think it's don't don't spread yourself out into too many markets. Uh, that's one of the challenges of funding deals nationwide and having marketing material go go out nationwide. Like I, I've been doing social media marketing on Facebook and Instagram. And so I get deals submitted every day all over the country in every single state, um, which is cool, but it's also exhausting. So, uh, you know, it's figuring out kind of your bread and butter of, hey, if I can, you know, sustainably create, you know, a $2.5 million EBITDA company in just doing deals within an hour of my house in Colorado Springs, why would I not do that? Um, you know, you get tons of market familiarity. Being local helps. Uh, shit, I bought a truck and depreciated it for the purpose of going out and looking at land. Um, and I love doing it. So I love driving out and looking at property in person. I love having the ability to do it in my backyard. Like it, it it's just fun for me. Um, and it's remembering that, uh, you know, yeah, this business is created to support, you know, my family financially, but it's also fun. So uh, don't get totally lost just being by behind a computer all day. Um, but yeah, so I think it's market consolidation uh, into a market that is in my backyard. That's one of the best and most competitive in the country. Now, as far as from a team building standpoint, because you mentioned that you get a lot of um, deal submissions. What is your team? Is it just you going through all of the submissions, the negotiations or... No, um, my wife works full time in the company. Um, she's our COO. Uh, so she does a lot on the kind of data systems marketing side. Um, and then I've got three part time acquisition managers. Uh, I fired my full time guy and I am rehiring uh, another full time guy. Um, so or gal. Uh, so right now interviewing, looking to hire someone local to Colorado Springs to come, you know, work in the business. Uh, that is a salary plus commission, um, which I think we're paying 32 K base and then 10% of every deal with, uh, you know, varying incentives based on, you know, timeline of the deal, size of the deal, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, anticipated compensation should be upwards of two to two to 400,000, uh, for that, but yeah, um, and then, yeah, bookkeepers, accountants, attorneys, uh, I outsource marketing um, sometimes to Nicholas Nick. Uh, and then uh, Ryan Pineda and I um, are running land ads together. Uh, so I'm his one land guy, which is kind of fun um, to work with Ryan on that. Uh, I see approximate cost per lead when doing Facebook ads. I don't know what my cost per lead is because so many of those leads are house leads that I just flip back to Ryan's company. Um, I'm spending about 10,000 a month doing uh, Facebook ads though. Sheesh. On just Facebook ads? I guess Instagram too, meta ads. Yeah. And how many leads are you getting? With houses, with everything? Uh, with houses and everything. Um. Uh, I'm trying to think because we, we changed it. So the house leads just go directly back to them for the most part. Um, it'll probably be, I'd say 450 to 500 leads for house and land. So yeah. whatever that math is of 10,000 yeah. divided by 450. So like 20 to 30 bucks a lead. Uh, they are all qualified, um, which is nice. And, um, for house wholesalers, they're super motivated. Uh, so, um, yeah, I I don't touch them. I started trying to touch them, and I just couldn't figure out what to do with a house. Uh, I'm just wasting my time. I understand. Thank you. Absolutely.
but that's I, I pay agency costs. So there, there's half of that is an agency cost. The other half is in actually running the ads. So if you know how to run Facebook ads and Instagram ads and that kind of thing, um, you'd be spending way, way less than what I'm spending. Um, part of the benefit is, you know, Ryan Pineda's face is like decently recognizable. So it's his face on the ads. He recorded all the videos and everything. Right. Then we will need more hours in, in, in the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say a while ago, we, we were trying to, we had a conversation. I think me and Nick had a conversation about running ads for, for land. Is it just, is it ads specifically for just bigger tracks? So I'm assuming it won't work well for the infield stuff, right? Or do they handle all of the targeting and all of that good stuff? Yeah, it's, um, you know, the, let me see if I can just find it and I can just kind of play it. Uh that way you can see exactly kind of what it is like this i want to make you a cash offer my name is ryan Panane and i bought hundreds of properties over the years and i would love to make you a cash offer on your land today it doesn't matter where the land is it could be an infill lot like this or custom homes or it could be a rural piece of property outside of the city it doesn't matter what the zoning is how big it is how small it is we will make you a cash offer on your piece of land today so if you'd like to get that offer just simply click the link below and fill out your information it takes less than 60 seconds and we will get you an offer on your land in the next 24 hours so click the link below and we'll get you that offer today wow that's crazy so pretty simple um pretty straightforward uh definitely love the um you know how like concise it is and i love the fact that i don't have to do anything yeah. um but no i think at some point i'd love to run my own ads just because meta can be so targeted and so specific where uh you know i would target of hey do you own land in colorado springs and you know it can be me out there with my truck like in eastern colorado springs and target just people local uh mm. to sell so definitely opportunity there i know nicholas knows um a good amount about about meta ads uh so yeah, it's the the ROAS is pretty high on it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's actually that was actually a very good ad to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Sweet. Uh, sweet. All right. Any other questions before we we wrap up? I know we're getting short on time here, but this is very good. Yeah, are realtors reluctant to accept the offer with a 30 to 45 day uh, due diligence? Of course, it's listed. So, I mean, I don't know if that's a problem for them, you know, taking it to their seller or what. So, like, I, I guess, Doug, what would the strategy be? You're you're talking about buying land off mar or on market from a realtor on with market. a long close? Right. Um. 30 to 45 well, day close is super standard in the land space. Right. So, yeah, I I mean, I do it all the time of like many title companies won't issue up and like OEC if you don't have a survey done. And if you're in an area where like surveyor is, I don't know, 16 weeks out type of thing, uh, right. it can give you more leverage of. Hey, I need to, you know, go out and look. I need to have someone go out and look at the property. I need to do, you know, verify this. I need to get my build costs. And that's something that I talk about a lot um, whenever negotiating with sellers and also within the marketing material I send out is, uh, you know, the build costs in this area are this much. I need to verify my numbers and everything, even if I'm not planning on building. That's ideally with an infill lot, what people are looking at doing. So, hey, it's going to cost, homes are selling for 300000 It's going to cost me, 250,000, I can only pay 10 grand for your land. And that's only giving me 20 K profit. Like, do you think that's fair or, you know, some iteration of that conversation with these people of like, if you can explain how you get to the number, um, most of the time that can make you a more effective negotiator because they had plans to build on their land most likely. Uh, and so they can empathize with you. Um, be real. You're an investor of like, how much money do you deserve to make? If you were a home builder, do you deserve to make 5,000 on a $300,000 home? That's probably not super fair. Um, 
So it's kind of playing at the heartstrings and, you know, using good negotiation tactics uh, with these sellers, because for the most part, in however many hundred deals I've done, and then however many tens of thousands of sellers I've negotiated with at this point in time, I've maybe had 10 distressed sellers total. Most people have owned this land for a long time and they don't give a shit if they sell it tomorrow or in 10 years from now, or they die with it. So I'm um, trying to like hammer home that point of like, I'll buy your land for cash. It's like, well, no, no, duh. You can only buy land for cash. Um, so uh, it's, it's like a silly, uh, silly uh, negotiation point. Um, I see Christopher has a, uh, a question. Um, or Doug, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, man. Perfect. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yes. So uh, I came across a, a lead today. Um, it's she's, it's a house, two bedroom, two bed, one bath, you know, like thousand square feet, whatever. Um, she's got a tenant in it. She's interested in selling it. Um, but she's got a, a, I believe her tenant has like a, a, a long-term lease. So like is, I guess what a, let's just say it was a good deal. She accepted a price. Like, is that, would you be able to maybe dispo that? Um, uh, or, or, maybe houses. Offer, or maybe offer more, um, if it already has a tenant in it, I guess what a house residential would be, would it be more valuable if it already has a tenant in it for a buy and hold guy? I don't touch houses. Um, so I might be the wrong person to ask about it. I don't know if any of the other people in the group are house wholesalers. Um, but yeah, sorry. I'm the, I'm the wrong person to ask about it. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'll just maybe, yeah. If anyone in general has any knowledge on, you know, a house being more valuable if it, if it you know comes with a tenant in it in place already. I, I I think the way to look at it is um what how how long is the lease? What is it for? Um, do they have a rent roll that they can provide? Uh, so what would be um, you know, it's hard with single family, but what's the cap rate of the deal? Of you know, so cal calculate what the NOI is, and. Uh, see what the general cap rate is in that particular market. Um, and yeah, figure out what it's worth from that standpoint. So if they're paying three grand a month and she wants 150 grand for the house, uh, that's a grand slam deal to anyone all day. Um, but if she's paying a thousand a month and she wants 400 K for the house, that's a really crappy deal because uh, after your debt service, you're going to be losing, you know, 1600 bucks a month. Yeah. So it's it, it's just math, I think. So look at it as if you're buying or selling a business, uh, if there's a tenant in it. Okay. All right, cool. Yeah, I appreciate that, man. Sure. Anyone else? Last question. Yep, last question before we wrap up. Okay. All right. Well, as always, it was always always a pleasure to come on come on here with you guys. Thank you for Mason again for providing a ton of value. Um, next week, you I forgot to add on to your point in regards to negotiations. And next week, if you guys need some help, I will be back uh calling your seller leads if you guys are if you guys have some leads in the pipeline and need help negotiating, I will get on the phone and talk to your sellers and try to lock something up for you. Okay. Um, and then maybe uh, Mason can help you fund a deal as well, too, that we lock up live. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So next week we'll be uh, talking to, to live sellers. Bring your leads. If you guys have any leads or any situations that you guys need help negotiating on. And I'll do my best um, to try to help you out and get a lock up. All right. Awesome. So see you guys next week. Enjoy the rest of your week and talk soon. Thanks, y'all. Mm -hmm.